Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again. This is episode two of five on our series about alcohol, and we've brought in one of my BFFs, Natalia Reagan. What's How up? How you doing, Trace? Good to be back. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, let me just get this right, drunken monkeys? Drunken monkey hypothesis. Drunken Let me say that again. I swear I'm not drunk. Drunken monkey hypothesis. The drunken monkey hypothesis. Yes. If you haven't watched yesterday's episode about where alcohol comes from in human history, make sure you do that. But today, we're going to talk about a little about why we evolved to be able to drink alcohol, or why we think we evolved to be well, able to. Well, there's this idea, um, actually by, um, it was proposed by uh, Dr. Robert Dudley at uh, UC Berkeley, so just right across oh, the way. Far. Uh, he was working in Panama with uh, monkeys, and he was thinking, hey, you know, these monkeys are eating fruit at a high level, and, and um, spider monkeys in particular are frugivores, meaning they eat primarily fruit. Okay. And what does fruit have? Ripe fruit? It has ethanol. Mm. And so there's this idea that uh, monkeys were uh, seeking out and sniffing out fruits with higher ethanol content. Why would they do that? Uh, because possibly they're sweeter, possibly they have more of a caloric intake. Mm -hmm. And so there was a study done in 2013 and 14, actually by uh, Dr. Christina Campbell, who was my thesis advisor, oh. and her student Victoria Weaver uh, in Panama, uh, on the uh, in the Panama Canal on, on Barro, Colorado Island. They basically looked at all the fruit that was eaten by spider monkeys and basically tested um, if they had ethanol or not. And they found that 85% of the pieces of fruit they picked up had a small degree of ethanol, usually between one to 2%. So not, a, I mean- Not like super drunk. No, case. no, they're not, you know, that spider monkey wasted yet. Got it. Not got quite it, yet, got it. but still a little something to think about. Okay, and then you were showing me this video earlier in St. <laughs> Kitts, there's a colony of vervet monkeys Look this video up. It's amazing. It's great. They've become uh, notorious because they steal alcoholic beverages from the tourists in the area because they have also a taste for alcohol, which is insane. You know, it's like primate relatives also like drinking alcohol just like us, but there are other similarities, right? Yeah, there are literally our drunk cousins. Basically. Cool. I like it. Uh, these vervet monkeys, first of all, they're not endemic to St. Kitts. They were actually brought over hundreds of years ago, and they've been thriving there, much to the chagrin of those that are, you know, have resorts there because right. they're stealing all the tourist drinks. And the cool thing about these monkeys is they actually are the the percentages and the ratio of of those that are teetotalers, uh, moderate drinkers, and excessive drinkers fall in line with with humans. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, we're seeing kind of these similarities. However, those that are the excessive drinkers are actually kind of revered. They're the ones that hmm. are looked up to, perhaps because they're maybe making more risky choices. Maybe. So all of a sudden it's like your drunk uncle's the cool guy, you know? Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's weird, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Well, I mean, <laughs> it does kind of make sense. You know, you're more risky behavior. If you're a risk taker, then you're probably like more yeah. apt to be the guy that everybody wants to like, you know, you're the cool guy, I guess. And monkey culture. The bad monkey, the bad boy monkey. Right. Got to get with him. So if some monkeys consume alcohol, like primates are consuming this ethanol as well, humans obviously do that too, but some humans can't. And that's always kind of confounded me. Well, it's not that they can't. They just probably shouldn't. There's a deficiency. They don't have um, the a, a particular enzyme to break down the acetaldehyde that's actually in the uh, alcohol. That uh, it needs to be broken down to acetate so it can be processed and be eliminated through the body in, in our urine stream. Okay. And when that's not broken down, it becomes toxic and it can build up in your system. It leads to vasodilation. So basically, you get that redness of the face. Mm -hmm. You get that Asian flush. Right. That's what it's called. Which I get sometimes. Um, yeah. Do you? Yeah. A little a bit. A little like pinkness going like on now. Pink, what's in, what's in that coffee? In hey. uh, <laughs> uh, it's also called the alcohol flush reaction. So that right there is a sign that maybe you should lay off the alcohol. However, hmm. in China, when markets were opening up about 15 years ago, there was an influx and uh, an availability of alcohol, and hmm. um, you can become almost immune to this. To the flush reaction. Uh, exactly. Which, but that doesn't mean that it, you're not building up the toxin. It just means that you're able to do it oh. and maybe survive you longer. You are more tolerant to the toxin exactly. as well. And that's bad. That's bad. And so that's something that we have to really consider when we're looking at alcohol poisoning throughout the ages. Right. Yeah. And alcohol poisoning is sort of commonly connected to being blackout drunk. But oh, they're yeah. not necessarily the same thing. Being blackout drunk is, doesn't mean you're on your way to alcohol poisoning necessarily, because some people don't even get blackout drunk, no matter how much they drink, for some reason. But blackout drunk has two different types. There's end block, and then there's fragmentary. What's end block all about? Oh, end block's scary. End block is basically you, you lose chunks of time. It's as if you've passed out, but you haven't passed out. You could have had conversations. You could have had right. intercourse. You could have gotten in a fist fight with a mm. monkey. You don't even know what you did, but you are just gone for like chunks of time. Right. So you're. So I look at it like 
your brain stops writing down your memories. It it stop it, like it hits the the stop re- button on its recording. Yes. Like it's not <laughs> recording things. You're still there. You're still basically your same self. You know, a, a drunken version of that. But your brain isn't writing that down anymore. So you don't necessarily know what's going on. And then fragmentary is then I imagine one step back from that. It's the brownout stage. If blackouts are in block, then a brownout would be like fragmentary loss yeah, of memory. Yeah, coming in and out. Yeah, and so both of these are caused by kind of the same deal. It's just one is a little more severe. Extreme, yeah. And actually, there was a study done in 1970 uh, by Goodwin and colleagues, and I'm not sure how ethical the study was, uh, looking at the impact of acute alcohol exposure and memory, Mm -hmm. because they wanted to understand what exactly a causes uh, blackouts, and uh, you know, does it have anything to do with um, long-term and short-term memory retainment? And this study was done in St. Louis uh, again in 1970, and so basically, they found ten subjects, um, all of them identified as being alcoholic, nine of which were actually pulled from unemployment offices. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. This was a party. And wow. they took them to a lab, and they actually asked them to consume roughly 16 to 18 ounces of 86-proof bourbon in approximately four hours. Holy crap. Ouch. That's I, a lot. Yeah, I would, that's dead for me. That's um, a lot of bourbon. <laughs> and beginning after just an hour, the subjects were asked to, to do some memory games. And um, they were given different stimuli, including, and this is where it gets a little funky, yeah. children's toys and scenes from erotic films. Because children's toys and erotic films really help people remember things, I guess, what somehow. What the hell? <laughs> So yeah, I, I was reading about this when we were when we were making our notes for this episode, and it says that most of the subjects seem to be able to recall the stimulus just a couple of minutes after the presentation, but 24 hours later they couldn't recall it at all. They were they were blacked out at the time. So even though at the time, like talking yeah. to them, they're like, oh yeah, this just happened. It's cool. But the next day they're like, what are you talking about? Mr. Potato I was playing with head children's and toys while watching, <laughs> I don't know, insert porn parody name here. But some people have blackouts and some people don't. And it usually connects to their, uh, their basically they're not moving memories from their short-term memory into their long-term memory. So mm-hmm. you can tell when your friend's blacked out because you're talking to them and they kind of have the same conversations on repeat. They're saying the same thing like, man, we should get out of here. And then you're talking to them like, no, we're going to stay a little bit because Natalia and I are having a good time. And then, then a couple minutes later, man, we should get out of here. Like everybody has a friend who's been to that point and that is exactly where drunk Jim was at that time he wasn't moving to his long-term memory but some people don't have blackouts at all like they just don't get them right there was another study uh, that some people are more susceptible than others to blackouts and memory loss and it said the difference shows different responses in the hippocampus in the brain and the researchers studied 24 different college students who routinely have two or three nights out with about five drinks per night that's uh, that's quite a few it sounds They're like spending you know, all their money on their uh, that's a lot of money, yeah. booze. That's true. Man. And so this is considered binge drinking, by the way. Binge drinking, that's, that's in that level. So they separated them into two groups, those who have a history of blackouts and those who don't, and they paired them up based on level of drinking experience. Then they scanned their brains while they were performing memory tasks, while they were either sober or after they drank a little bit. In the sober groups, they showed two you know, very similar brain patterns. It was basically the same. But when they were drinking, there were huge differences in brain patterns. And they only drank to like the legal limit, about 0.08 on the BAC level. And those who were prone to blackouts had decreased activity in parts of the brain responsible for turning experiences into memories, as well as attention and cognitive functioning. See, that's scary. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and actually, weirdly, though, all those, uh, those individuals that ha- were having issues and there, there was brain, you know, they, they were showing, um, you know, changes in the hippocampus. At that moment, they felt like they were fine. So, mm. which is also more disturbing. I mean, imagine if you were at a party and you, you, you think you're fine. But right. you're actually, you're, you know, your brain is reacting in a way that you probably should not be drinking. It, it's troubling. And that's one of those things that I think this is important for, especially students starting school, you know, because yeah. that's, that's, if you didn't drink in high school and you just, all of a sudden you get to college and you're blacking out, that's terrifying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, luckily I, I'm not prone to blackouts, but I didn't drink when I was younger. I only drank when I was a little older. So it was like, for me, I would, you yeah. wouldn't know where your limit is anymore. Like you wouldn't know. You'd never have learned that. And it doesn't just like come all of a sudden. You'll have your first beer and you're like, I can only have three of these. <laughs> like it takes a little while to get used to and figure out where your limit is. Uh, study researcher Reagan Weatherill, PhD, University of Pennsylvania, okay. has a quote and it says, what could be happening is that some individuals have a brain which can handle or compensate to a certain point. But 
if you put a cognitive load on it like alcohol, it gets overloaded and things aren't working as efficiently. Also, yeah, good name, Reagan. Right? It's yeah, good. not so bad. That's nice. I, I actually, uh, this quote really rattled me um, because of all this talk about blackouts. Uh, if recreational drugs were tools, alcohol would be a sledgehammer. And their point there is that alcohol affects all your faculties, right. all of them, yeah. um, and not always in the best ways. We, you know, you've talked about some benefits. However, there are some pretty uh, scary side effects too. Absolutely, so, yeah. drink responsibly, children. Very much so. By children, I mean adults. Responsibly, people who are over twenty-one over in the 21. United States, except for on Native American reservations. We'll get to that later. Okay. We'll get to that later. But when it comes to alcohol, a lot of people associate different alcohols with different levels of like party time. You know, some people say I only black out when I drink blank, you know, gin and, you know, whiskey makes you fight and tequila makes your clothes come Rum off or whatever. Rum makes me turn into Bridget. Exactly, you know, but there is actually no scientific evidence that Bridget should exist more for rum than any other type <laughs> <No>. of alcohol. <laughs> Bridget should just show up. She should, I, all she'll be time. here anytime. I mean, no. <laughs> depends how many more coffees we have. But uh, there is some science that shows that there are, uh, have you heard of these congeners? Yes. Yeah, congeners, which are, they make hangovers worse, mm -hmm. and they're part of like the byproducts of the distilling process, but there's nothing that points to the, like whiskey making you fight more than anything else. No, there's no scientific data that uh, these alcohols affect anybody differently. So no matter what, no matter what you're drunk on, you're always the same drunk. Correct. Cool. So there was a study in 1970 that monitored eight men, and four of them uh, drank bourbon for nine days and then switched to vodka for another nine. It's mm -hmm. a, a lot of drinking. That's a lot of drinking. These studies. Uh, the other four men started on 86-proof liquor that was mixed with caramel and then switched to bourbon. Got it. Okay. And But regardless of the liquor or the congeners added, uh, they all behaved the same, starting with being more sociable and then becoming more depressed and then hostile when they continued to drink. So. Maybe just don't get to that point, people. Right, yeah, Yeah, absolutely. maybe just you know, cut off at two. The, I don't know. I've had this conversation with other friends who feel like they get different drunk and different alcohols, and it comes down to psychology. You know, if maybe you only drink tequila when you're doing shots, right? And if you only drink tequila when you're doing shots, you're probably only doing shots because it's that kind of night. Yeah. And if it's that kind of night, then your clothes come off. And, that's, and it's you're not the tequila, the it's because of the psychology of what you drink at different times and what you drink in different occasions, you know? You know, you might have a night where I do whiskey shots and whiskey shots are when you're depressed and then you're fighting people because you're drinking the whiskey. Yeah. But it's not because of the whiskey, it's because of the psychology going into That's drinking That's true. The and people ought to remember that uh, when drinking, when if you you suffer from depression already or you're feeling already a little bit depressed and you drink alcohol, which is a depressant, right. Yeah. Recipe for disaster. Yeah. So um, yeah. that's something to be considered. Of course, there are also animals that can drink alcohol and not feel any of these effects. For example, my hero, the tree shrew. The Malaysian pentailed tree shrew, in fact, uh, its diet is 100% beer. 100%. Wow. Live science. Some college students like that. Yeah. It drinks the fermented nectar of the Burton palm plant, and it's not like a lot of alcohol okay. in this nectar, but it's 3.8% alcohol oh. content. The thing is, it just doesn't exhibit any drunkenness. No matter how much of that ethanol it's consuming, hmm. they don't seem to exhibit drunk behavior the way that other animals do, which is kind of crazy. That is pretty neat. They think by studying this, they can learn how to treat alcohol poisoning in the future, which is pretty awesome. That would be awesome, actually, yeah. especially with binge drinking in college. Absolutely, which is an affliction that many of us have suffered. I think alcohol poisoning is actually a huge problem all over the world. It's not just here, and it's mm -hmm. not just in college. And that's why we make laws to combat and regulate alcohol, you know, for various populations. We've even tried to prohibit consumption of alcohol completely. Remember Prohibition? Oh, vaguely. Yeah, I, was, yeah. Yeah, I was about 10. <laughs> so tomorrow we're going to talk about Prohibition and all about that stuff. But before we go, I just want to say thank you, Natalia, for coming and talking to us about the drunken monkey hypothesis and about blackouts and about how it, our brains are affected. Where can people find more of your awesome stuff? Well, you can go to YouTube. Uh, I'm at natalia 13 Reagan, uh, and you can see some fun videos about the evolution of boobs and butts and monkeys. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at natalia 13 Reagan. Cool. Thanks a lot. And make sure you go down into the comments. Let us know what you thought of this episode. Subscribe to Test Tube Plus. Check out yesterday's episode about where alcohol came from in the first place. And we will see you tomorrow. Yeah.